Hi, everyone. Welcome to Boulder Startup Week. We'll wait for everyone to dial in here. We'll start seeing the participant number increase, I believe, automatically. Yep, it's going up. It's working. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before I kick off formally, we'll just take a minute or two to let you all come into the room. For those of you in Boulder, you know that it's a dreary, a dreary gray day today. I want to thank you all so much for joining us from your basements, from your offices, from uh, my garage studio. <laughs> I wish that we were all together today in downtown Boulder having this really important conversation about femtech and women's care, specifically as it relates to the coronavirus pandemic and what's going to happen afterwards. Good. It looks like we have a lot of people joining us. Um, you know, if we were all together live, we'd be asking this question. And I'd ask if you could raise your hands and just tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, if you could answer our Zoom poll here, click I'm an investor. I'm a founder at a company. I'm a patient. I'm a consumer. I work with startups or other. You'll be able to see quickly who's in the room, and this will really help us understand how to tailor our conversation and um, understand who, who's in the room so we can have a really robust conversation. Good. It looks like we have some founders. We have some patients, investors, as well as startups. So really good mix. Again, um, I think everybody's in, so we will formally kick off. Thank you so much. I'm going to end this poll. And so, hi, everyone. So I'm Kristen Apple. Um, I am the president of Linus. We are a healthcare innovation insights and strategy, strategy consulting firm specifically focused on helping um, leaders solve and answer questions and problems as it relates to insight, strategy, and innovation. Before we get started, there's some um, housekeeping things I want to take care of. And the first thing, and you can see this on the right-hand side of your screen if you're using the Zoom chat function, is I want to thank the Health Track sponsor, Founders First System. Founders First System is a simple framework that helps entrepreneurs stay healthy and happy while they build their companies and change the world. We've been using frameworks to optimize our companies for years. And this is the first framework for optimizing founders themselves. Aaron Houghton and the Founders First team would like you to join their online community. You can see that information on the right hand side of your screen. I also want to thank the general sponsors to Boulder Startup Week. Those are Techstars, Honey, Name.com, Downtown Boulder Partnership, and the University of Colorado. We will be recording this session today, and all content for Boulder Startup Week's virtual events will live online on the YouTube channel for boulderstartupweek.org. So if you want to share this information with friends or colleagues, feel free to do so. We will live forever on the internet. <laughs> Okay, so let's get this, this conversation started. So, as you all know, coronavirus has made a serious impact and um, effect on women's health. With IVF clinics being closed, in-office in visits for prenatal visits being virtually turned off and having to move to telemedicine, women are starting to take control of their own care in their own hands. Healthy women are being put at risk because of some of the practices that some offices are having. And really what I really want to have a great conversation around, and we're joined by some really great female leaders today from our femtech community, is what, how and what women are doing to control their own care during the pandemic, and then what trends might continue off afterwards. We're going to focus our conversation specifically today on the continuum of care that goes from trying to conceive or fertility all the way through postpartum. We will have time for question and answer at the end. There is a Q&A box that we'll be using on Zoom. You can see if you hover down on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box will pop up. Feel free to put your questions in there and at the end of our discussion, we'll be, we'll be answering those. So let's get started. So Amy Beckley, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Amy Beckley. Um, I am the founder and the inventor of the Prove Test. Um, and so I invented this product after my own battle with infertility. Um, I was diagnosed with unexplained infertility and told that IVF was my only option. Um, and I later found out that I had a simple ovulatory disorder that was preventing me from conceiving. 
And if I had simple diagnostic information that proved provides, <laughs> um, I could have conceived naturally. So I made it my mission to empower women with more information. So we're the first and only FDA cleared at home ovulation confirmation kit on the market today. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Amy Shannon, go ahead. Hi, I'm Amy Shannon, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Prematemp. In the recent years, I've really leveraged learnings from traditional pharmaceutical and medical device into employing it for digital and AI approaches to empower all the stakeholders. So as a mom of three, I'm really excited to be able to help other women in their fertility journey. And Prematemp is a chronobiology company, and our first application is in women's healthcare. We apply health-trained AI to continuous core body temperature to identify predictive physiological patterns. So with this approach, we are about to la launch the Prius sensor, or the Prius system, which is a sensor and it's an app and it's a proprietary algorithm that provides a seamless and convenient fertility journey, um, fertility management experience. And Priya uses these minute changes in core body temperature to identify the ovulation window the first month of use. And then the data is used to alert a woman through her phone of her ovulation window. And then we're also the proprietors of the Kandara Women's Health Platform. And that includes an app that's been downloaded by about 1.5 million women. And it's a system that allows women to track their temperature as well as a whole bunch of other parameters in their efforts to try to conceive as well as to try to avoid conception or just to track health. And they come to this platform for education, but even more importantly, they share their data there, their observations and their questions with other women in the community. So it's really interesting to learn from that dialogue and um, apply it to what's happening in the season. Thanks, Amy. Hi, I'm Judith Nowlin, and I'm the founder and former CEO of iBirth, which is one of the very first femtech solutions in the marketplace when we launched back in 2009. After serving about a million families through both our direct-to-consumer and B2B channels, iBirth was acquired by Baby Scripts about two years ago. Um, where up until recently, I was the chief growth officer helping to create new models of pregnancy and postpartum care through remote patient monitoring. I now advise uh, healthcare and technology startups, helping them to bring innovation solutions to market. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, I'm up, I guess. I'm Sarah Bates, I'm the CEO and co-founder of MamaMed. MamaMed is the digital marketplace that connects new mothers with, with postnatal health and wellness specialists. Our personalized childbirth recovery guide helps new moms learn what's normal and what's not after birth, and then matches them to the best practitioner who can meet their specific needs. I started this company two years ago after giving birth and experiencing firsthand the huge gap that exists in supporting new mothers in their own health and recovery from childbirth. And prior to that, I ran a data science and machine learning consulting company that helps startups use data to better serve their customers. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. We are all so grateful that you're joining us on this panel today and the solutions that you are all either commercializing or have built your, yourself have really changed and are changing the way that women are controlling their own care. I'd love to start this, the conversation by sort of setting the, setting the framework, setting the, the stage and hearing a patient or a consumer story that you've really um, interacted with over the last eight weeks since the coronavirus pandemic. What's happening? You know, what, what are women doing now? Tell me a story. And Amy, if, Beckley, if you want to talk, um, we have some celebra celebrations to really have here with your um, ProveCat being able to be launched directly at Target. But I'd love first, um, we'll talk more about that in a second. I'd love just to set the stage and tell us a patient story. Yeah, yeah. So um, ASRM, which is the Society of Reproductive Medicine, on March 17th decided that fertility treatments was elective and shut down all of the fertility treatments and women couldn't get any access to care. Um, and so women were coming to us saying, it would be really great if I had in-home solution to help meet my needs. So typically women have to go to a doctor's office to get a blood draw to confirm they're actually ovulating. Our test uses urine, and so they can do it at home. They can buy it off Amazon, Target, our website, order the kit, get it delivered, and then they get the results. 
Um, and women were just so excited, excited to have this because um, fertility treatments now are back on, but they're not the same. Um, we had a woman that went in for her fertility treatment. She had to leave her house alone. So her husband was at home. She sat in the garage. She had to wait for the doctor to call her. Once they called her and said it was her turn, she had to go through this checkout thing where they had to check her temperature and they had to make her sanitize her hands, put gloves on, put a mask on, go upstairs. She was there by herself. She was escorted by a nurse place to place so she wouldn't touch door handles, this and that. And then she left. And so when you're doing something as fertility treatments, when you're looking at a pregnancy and you're seeing the baby's heartbeat, these are things that you, you know, you want to share, right? And so it's a very, very scary time for women that they have to do this alone and there's so many precautions. And so the more women can do at home in the comfort and protection and with their loved ones and their, you know, their family, um, the better. So. Thanks for sharing that. What else are you um, all seeing in terms of patients? I mean, the anxiety that women are going through to really have this visit is probably keeping many of us away from actually going through, you know, preventative services, going to our, our prenatal visits. Yeah, I'll, t I'll speak to the pregnancy experience. And this is kind of not a single patient story, but rather just a, a collective story of women who are pregnant right now, um, delivering their babies right now and in the immediate postpartum time. Um, you know, at, because we're trying to reduce those in-person visits, um, many, many um, facilities and um, healthcare organizations have reduce the total number of prenatal visits for moms, right? So where the standard had been 12 to 14 prenatal visits, including the one six week postpartum, um, as soon as COVID came around, these physicians and care providers were looking for a way to dramatically reduce the need for women to come on site. And they found that they could reduce visits down to anywhere from four to six prenatal visits in total throughout the total course of the pregnancy, uh, which means that, you know, pregnant women, they, they like to be touched. They like to be engaged with, right? They like to hear their baby's heartbeats, all these kinds of things. So it, it just means that there is a lot more um, opportunity to, to reach and touch pregnant women in the comfort of their own homes now um, and not, not uh, eliminate some of the, the parts of pregnancy care that are so essential that go above and beyond just uh, data collection and determining if there's risk and, and need for intervention in that risk. Yeah. Wow, oh, and that is a drastic reduction in the number of visits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sarah, you have um, first of all postpartum visits before you started Mama Bat Mama Men. Is one of the reasons we're we're at virtually none. And now, what's happening? What have you heard? Yeah. So now, um, postnatal care has really suffered as a result. Um, you know, like like Judith mentioned, there's there's one postpartum visit after birth around six weeks and even that before the pandemic was pretty um, not very well attended because, you know, for many reasons. But now with, um, with the pandemic, that's being less attended. And then in addition, you have way fewer um, support visits, which might be lactation consulting, pelvic floor physical therapy for rehab, um, mental health, all of that stuff is really um, suffering as a result. Amy, um, Shannon, you know, we had talked a lot about um, fertility and the, the process of women, you know, trying to conceive from a patient's perspective in this time. And what would you say the biggest adaptation is that women are trying to make in terms of controlling their own care, specifically as it relates to the TTC journey? So I think that, you know, one of the great things that are coming out of this is there's, there's been some great education out there about the fertility process, but there's more and more. We've see, we put on a webinar a few weeks ago with the University of Colorado Anschutz to talk about what are some of the steps that women can take as their elective um, assisted reproductive um, procedures were put on hold. 
um, which, you know, when you have just such a short window every month, putting it on hold one month is a big deal, um, especially as women have been waiting longer and longer um, age-wise to be able to have their children. That window closes with every month, and there's a sense of urgency. But I think that we're seeing that, you know, all the organizations that are on this call today have done an excellent job, as have others in the industry, and really provide some excellent information. And I think that women are taking responsibility or taking, um, want to be empowered with as much information as they can. So for example, we had a patient um, or a user on Kandara last week that was talking about the fact that they've been tracking um, their cycles to such detail that remotely they were able to provide data to their physician and they were able to diagnose endometriosis in that particular patient. Now, obviously, they'll, when they go back to their healthcare professional, they'll have further tests, et cetera. But women are becoming more empowered with data so that they're having objective, quantitative discussions with their physicians. And those, those data um, conversations, the quantitative discussions that are happening with our HCPs, does anyone here, can anyone speak to that? How are, how are physicians reacting to this sort of um, more data, more control? What's been your experience? I can jump in a little bit. Um, so informed patients have better health outcomes. There is quite a, a bit of research that supports that. So I think um, generally the, the reaction from primary care providers is positive because people are asking better questions. They are more aware of what's going on in their bodies so they can recognize what's a symptom and what's normal and, and be able to ask those uh, have those conversations and ask those questions. I think um, I think it, it really helps healthcare providers be able to do the, their jobs more effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with remote patient monitoring, um, when you were connected into the EMR systems, that the patients aren't necessarily initiating the, the conversation with their clinicians, but rather the data is flowing up into the clinician's records. And then the clinicians are, you know, flagged or um, triggers are set off that say this is a data point that is outside the range of normal and does need some immediate attention, which is, um, you know, COVID or not, I, I think that that is one of the best things that's ever happened to healthcare to where, you know, somebody who, who is medically trained can say, I, I know that you think that that might be normal or you might be feeling all kinds of crazy because you're pregnant or postpartum right now and you don't know what's up versus down. But I know that that blood pressure data point is actually um, put you at risk and we need to deal with it and we should deal with it now before it accelerates into t something that we can't turn around, right? And so it's just a beautiful, yeah. like in, in COVID is the time, you know, if, if there was ever a time, now's the time for that kind of, those data points to be coming in and flowing up to the clinicians to review and then intervene. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, you know, COVID has put a barrier to a lot of different things, right? Like, you know, we should be seen a certain number of times during our pregnancy. And the fact is we're not because other things kind of got in the way. And so the more we can be empowered about what we're going through and have those conversations and reach out, the more we can alert that physician because they are busy. You know, you get 10 minutes of their time. You want to make that effective. Um, you know, and so if you can guide them and say, hey, I think this is why I'm not conceiving or hey, I'm really having a hard time with this baby latching or, you know, something like that, like you need to speak up and you need to have that education. Otherwise, you won't have that, that, um, you know, that help that you need. So. Well, to build on Amy's thought there, some of the feedback we get from our Kandara users is that when they talk to their physicians in general, sometimes they're put in kind of general, you know, population management assessments. When they can come with precision data about their own healthcare or their own bodies, now that does two things. It changes it from a subjective conversation to a more objective, quantitative conversation. And number two, it brings confidence to that woman in that discussion. She's got something to bring to the table. She's got very specific questions to engage. And I think it, it, it changes the tone of that conversation and the expectation of what she expects to get out of it while she's there. Yeah, 
exactly. I mean, I think that by having the data, by being prepared for that conversation, we as patients can engage better with our HCPs. We can have more successful visits and it moves that relationship from sort of top down to more of a partnership relationship, which I think could be, you know, one of the things that's changing um, about women's health and specifically on the continuum that we're discussing as it is here, as it relates to the pandemic. Okay, so one of the things that, that we know is that habits um, start to become permanent routines at three months. We are almost at three months. Uh, we are um, just into the ninth week here of being on lockdown here in Boulder. Um, habits are forming. What good habits do you think are happening from um, our care continuum, from our women, from our, the physicians, from the healthcare system, as it specifically relates to uh, fertility and pregnancy as well as postpartum? I got a good one here. So <laughs> when you have access to healthcare, um, you tend to go at the speed of light, right? So when I went through infertility, um, I was... I felt like I was getting too old and my, my time was ticking. I was running out of time. And the doctor said, you have to do IVF or it's nothing. And so I did. And that was like $40,000 worth of IVF. But if I didn't have that resource and I kind of took a step back and I learned a little bit more about my body and what my body was telling me, I could have conceived. And I did. So my, my second child, my daughter was conceived naturally with just a, a hormone supplement. Like it was so easy like quote unquote easy, mm -hmm. but it was like, you know, maybe if we take some time and just learn about our body, like we don't have to keep, you know, running, like we don't have to say, oh, this is the only option. Like, you know, this is teaching us that there are other options and there's other things that we can do. Um, you know, when, when COVID happened, all the fertility treatments got canceled. We gave out um, 34 kits and we've had two pregnancies from those. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, we've saved women from, you know, having to go through this invasive procedures when they just needed to learn a little bit about their, about their bodies. And, you know, I hope that that trend continues um, because, you know, honestly, it's scary to go outside. I don't like going to the mailbox because I got to put on a mask. I got to sanitize my hands. Like I would much rather stay at home. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a great example. I think that the acceptance or the, the studies and the statistics are showing us the acceptance of telehealth has really accelerated. It's been available for almost a decade um, in, certain, in certain systems, but physicians have been very hesitant to accept it and patients have been very hesitant to accept it. Just around our office, we've had numbers of people, when I say around our, our Zoom office, um, we've had numbers of people on our team talk about the fact that they had never used telehealth and they've used it several times and they will never go back. Um, of course, they'll go back for things that actually need exams, but for a discussion, they're not gonna deal with the parking lots and the drives and the waiting rooms um, when they can be in the comfort of their home, own home. So I think that we will see the hockey stick effect on the adaption and adoption of telehealth um, appointments. Yeah, I think that's particularly the case in um, the postnatal world when, in addition to typical barriers like, you know, or even just the time it takes to get to the office, you also have a, a newborn that you have to like pack up and like time around nap times and feedings and all that stuff. Like that's, that can be a huge barrier to care or finding childcare for that baby if you need to go by yourself to a visit. And so we're, we're really seeing telehealth take off in the, in the post, postpartum space. And I've heard really great stories about lactation consulting, for example, that can be done, you know, in the, in the privacy of your own home. You don't have to, like I said, time it around the baby and pack up the baby and bring the car seat and bring the, all the other stuff and the diaper bag. I mean, it's so much more convenient and people love it. I've been thinking of um, this COVID time as a time of the great pause, like everything is paused, which brings me back to my old doula days where um, we talk a lot about as, as a doula and in women's health, like tune in, tune into yourself 
tune into what your intuition is saying, what your body is saying. You know, this is, this is part of the kind of counsel and guidance throughout pregnancy and labor and delivery and postpartum and parenting, right? Just um, start listening. And when you get to pair your own intuition and that tuning in with some of these other data points, you can, you know, a lot of times women, pregnant women say, something felt off, something wasn't quite right. And then we get to pair it with like remote patient monitoring and uh, telehealth immediate access to physicians, uh, nurses, lactation consultants. All of a sudden we're living in a very different reality than we were, you know, prior to the great pause. I like the way you talk about that, the great pause, um, because really it is doing this level set, right, of, you know, we're all sort of on the same playing field. We all have access to the same tools, um, and not all, but a lot of us do. And um, what happens now will may shape and probably will shape what looks like in the future, what healthcare looks like in the future. We've talked a lot about the positives of um, women being able to take control of their own care, and specifically as it relates to the pandemic. And um, what are some dangers? What are some you know, bad habits that might be forming or some dangers of care. And I want us to think um, beyond sort of our, um, you know, our bolder bubble, if you will, and think more um, at, the, at the national level. What are some dangers? What are some areas of concern that we um, in our startup community here can focus on and think about? Kristen, I think as we talk about remote patient monitoring, remote sensors, digital health care, telehealth, that we all have to be very cognizant of the privacy concerns. Um, we've got women who are putting their most private information out and trusting us with that. So our policies and our procedures and our safeguards, um, you know, and exploring one level deeper as to those vendors that we work with, you know, what do they do with the data that we're partnering with them on? Um, I think it's gonna be one of the most important issues for us as a community um, address and address on behalf mm -hmm. of our customers. Mm -hmm. Good. So data privacy. What else? Well, I, I think there's a flip side to, um, you know, women kind of having to rely on them, themselves and also the internet to educate themselves at this point since they don't have as much access to um, the health professionals in person and also you know, maybe some of the more casual sources of information like they had before, like the, the mom groups and the postpartum yoga and um, all of the, you know, the breastfeeding circles and all that stuff. Um, now they're, now they're relying on the internet and that, that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, right? Not, not everything you read on the internet is, is um, true. <laughs> and so I think, you know, that is a risk, but I think potentially it could be a good thing too with, you know, with the growing amount of, of evidence-based information that is available on the internet, like we talked about earlier. Um, I think that could be a positive too, that as long as that information is available, that people will be better informed, but there is also just the risk of misinformation. Yeah, Absolutely. to follow up on that, um, you know, you don't know what you don't know right? We're, we're, we as women are not medical providers. We don't exactly know what we should be looking at all the time. And so, you know, this is the first time I've actually heard about the, the prenatal visits going so low. And that's actually really scary because I've not, you know, when I was pregnant with my son, I'd never been pregnant. I don't know what to look for. I, I, you know, people say, oh, your feet are, sw you know, swelling. That's normal. Well, I don't know if that's normal or preeclampsia. I have no idea. I've never done this before. And so, you know, we make it so scary to go outside. I fear that people aren't going to want to go outside when they really should, right? I've heard stroke and, and heart attacks have gone down. I don't know if it's that they've gone down. It's just they're not going to the hospital because they don't want to sit in the ER and get COVID, right? So it's like there's a, there's a balance. And what I fear is that, you know, our fear is going to keep us from getting the, the proper care because we don't know what to look for. Yeah. And, you know, in addition, there something we were suffering from as a nation prior to COVID, but I think post COVID we will suffer from even more is what is deemed uh, maternity care deserts 
where, mm -hmm. for instance, in Colorado, um, half of our Colorado counties are deemed maternity care deserts, which means there's not a single OB provider and no obstetrical services offered at the local hospital. And because of the um, economic impacts of, of kind of how everything is, is falling, I, I think we risk more of our rural hospitals shutting down in the coming months. I mean, they were already mm -hmm. walking the line and now, uh, you know, even more may be at risk, which means that, you know, with some of the patient populations we work with, some women are driving, they have to drive 90 minutes, two hours. We've even, we have some care providers that have people coming from three hours away to get into their visits. And so, you know, it's, it's a huge concern. Um, to think about these uh, deserts becoming uh, even greater in their spread across our nation and the access to care with proximity. Of course, there's a silver lining, and that is, you know, telehealth, remote, virtual, sure. home, all that. That's a silver lining to it. But there's, there's, a, there's a balance um, to be had, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from data privacy to... Um, misinformation to, you know, sort of the maternity care deserts that are out there. And then Amy, exactly that first story that you told us about um, the fertility um, clinic where a woman has to wait in her car and get her temperature. The, the entire process is stressful to begin with. And then feeling like you're, you know, sort of being escorted through this, this system with bars and um, rules. I mean, that, that probably um, heightens the anxiety, I would imagine, quite a bit, if not um, exponentially. So um, certainly a lot of things that, that we can do to improve on post-pandemic once we, or as we move, make it through the pandemic and we think about improving women's care during this time. I'm going to transition a little bit about, I mean, we talked a lot about behavior. We talked a lot about the implications of the impact on, um, on women's health care. I want to look ahead and start talking about innovation and um, what might change, what might stick around. And um, specifically, you know, in, in many industries, we're all sort of predicting new collaborations, um, where in the restaurant industry, we might see our favorite two shops partnering up and becoming one, or um, in the life sciences industry, a downstream and an upstream provider coming together. What collaborations um, might we predict in femtech, or what, what might you hope to see? I think we are, um, I think we're gonna see a lot of partnerships between um, technology and software companies and less traditionally techie type um, health and wellness providers. Mm -hmm. um, we've already even started to see that in our space a little bit. You see, we see people who have offered services like massage therapy or acupuncture or nutrition and that kind of stuff, um, which is not mm -hmm. typically very techie specifically, mm -hmm. um, but they've started to offer virtual visits and virtual care. And I think um, if they, I think we're going to start to see that more often that they're going to partner with platforms that can that can share that and distribute that at scale. No, yeah, that's great. So mm -hmm. sort of those non-traditional players coming in to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I see um, partnerships with mm -hmm. clinical providers, physici physicians, nurses, midwives, and community-based providers. The lactation consultants, the the home visitors, the you know home nurses, those kinds of things like. To, to help provide a stronger continuum of care for the whole person, um, not just the person who has a condition who's coming in to be treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that we'll see, Bye. I think we'll see pharmaceutical and device companies who don't have the, tradi traditionally don't have as much engagement with their end users, um, tapping these communities to learn more about the user experience and more about the condition and providing more of that whole product approach, as well as you know, trying to, and again, this is where the privacy policy comes in, trying to learn from them based on the data um, that we're all accumulating um, with digital engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
So I would love to see, and I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm hoping this happens, um, but more physician adoption with um, at home use devices and things. Um, so what I've seen is a lot of doctors will, you know, I got a positive pregnancy test. Okay, come in the office and we'll confirm. They take the same pregnancy test out of their thing. Okay, we are confirmed. And it's like, well, didn't you just trust me that I, that I took it? Um, and so there's a little bit of, you know, well, the doctor did it and the patient, you know, we're not quite trusting her that she did it correctly. So I would love to see more adoptions as we say, you know what, we have to start, you know, training women to do it properly and understand it. And, you know, some of these, you know, digital health record back and forth will be like, yeah, you know, the, she put the thermometer in her mouth and it got the right reading. Um, <laughs> you know, it's something very, very basic like that, where it's like, I don't have to yeah. go in there and get my blood pressure taken by a nurse. I can use this at home and have that information transmitted. I can, you know, we can take a pregnancy test at home and have that information transmitted. So it's more of the connection between what patients have access to and getting that information to the doctor where they can use and trust and, and use that information to care for their, for their patients. That would be great. I, I want that to happen so badly as well. I know. <laughs> what do you think it's going, I know, I know, I know we've talked about it. So what do you think it's going to take? to get those HCPs, right? Because I'm guessing that this conversation is starting with our primary care provider. It's starting with our internal medicine um, practitioner before that patient has to transition to a more advanced, um, you know, maternal uh, fetal medicine doctor or an IVF specialist. What can happen in that primary care office? What needs to change for that to start saying, okay, yeah, she tested her, she did the proof test, these were her results, she did the pregnancy test, whatever it might be, what needs to change? Well, I think what, what needed to change was COVID, is that doctors had no choice. And so, you know, before COVID, doctors were like, oh, well, that's an, that's an over-the-counter product. I'm not going to believe that. You need to come in and get a, and a blood test, um, you know, because that was a medical procedure and this is just an over-the-counter test. COVID mm -hmm. hit, they couldn't physically see their patients. And so they were like, oh my gosh, how do I get my patients one of your kits? They need to test their progesterone. Like, you, like you need to do this. Like, how do I, how do I, you know? And it's like, it was the, the, the environment that changed their mindset. And they're like, I don't have another choice. And so now, you know, we've kind of put our foot in the door and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Like patients don't have to come here anymore for something trivial as a blood drop. It's so amazing. And you have actually giving them better information. And it's most of the time cheaper. So, mm -hmm. um, so you know, mm -hmm. I think that is another silver lining. If, if you know, nothing about COVID is great. I, I just, you know, want to be very clear. <laughs> but it's like, you yeah. know, a little bit of that mindset mm -hmm. has changed. And, and it could be a, you know, something positive, a positive change that's come out of a really horrible uh, situation. I'm in agreement. I think it's all about mindset. So, you know, I've been working in health tech with clinicians for the past decade. And, you know, oftentimes people just naturally default to what they know. This is what I know. This is what I learned. This is how we do things. Um, and kind of that rock in a hard place, no other options, uh, circumstance such as COVID comes along and all of a sudden, you know, what, what we in health tech have been saying, like, it's not, it's actually not as hard as you think. And we've got a lot of best practices to help guide you along uh, to make the, the change and to provide it, you know, these services or these products to meet your patients right where they're at. Um, we just lost your sound. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Connection. Um, mm -hmm. So Thanks. yeah, just the, the idea that, you know, um, when you have no other option, all of a sudden that hard thing doesn't seem as hard as it once did. And so, you know, silver lining, blessing in disguise, now all everybody getting on to, you know, everybody getting, getting on to telehealth, everybody getting on to remote patient monitoring, ordering Amy's kits and trusting the results and, and making clinical decisions and taking clinical action as a result, is it's kind of a, a new a new normal that I am 100% certain will stick around. It's not going anywhere because now we're on the other side of that hard thing, and we realize it's it's actually not as hard as we made it out to be. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to ask my last question here. 
and um, open it up to Q&A. So if you guys go to the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A box. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, as I'm asking my last question, uh, one of my last questions, uh, please type in your, your Q&A. Um, I'd love to hear from you all in the audience. We know we have people joining us from around the country um, in different communities, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. So Amy Shannon, I'll start this, my last question here with you, and it's our speed round. Um, of course, we have to do a speed round on a panel. So in, in 30 seconds or less, you know, what does the future of femtech look like in fertility, pregnancy, and postnatal or postnatal? So. Well, I think we've talked about a lot of the trends here, Kristen, in terms of remote patient monitoring and all of those tools. A couple other things that I think that we're going to see more and more of are clinical trials being decentralized um, and remote clinical trials. Again, I think that will help the paradigm shift of empowering women and trusting women in those things. I think the other element is really the connection, and we've kind of touched on this, but not gone deep into it, of a difference between just women's reproductive health and fertility health and how that connects to women's health overall, whether that be mental health or physical health. And that this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg on that, that women aren't just little men, but that women have specific functionality that not only affects this fertility journey we're talking about, but it affects all other clinical manifestations that are happening, um, you know, both short-term and long-term, and that through these partnerships and through this awareness of our own bodies and more and more objective information, we'll be able to tap those things for overall mental and physical health. Great. Who wants to go next? 30 seconds. I will. Future of them. Yes. I'll just say in addition to, um, you know, more evidence-based information and more data available, um, there's going to be, you know, that's going to lead to, like we talked about, more informed patients and better connection to resources. But also I think that's going to drive a lot of um, research for women's health. I think, I mean, we all know there's very little research done for women. Women weren't even um, allowed to be part of clinical trials until fairly recently in history. So um, we're going to be able to drive more, more research and then hopefully some more innovative treatments and better health outcomes for women. Right. Good. I have a couple of questions here that's coming from the audience. Um, this first question, what advice would you have for investors? What are the underlying problems that are looming that need to be addressed for us to benefit from the futures that are being talked about? Ooh, I got a, I got a really good one. <laughs> I'll try not to be too, too long. Um, you know, we were going to start raising money and we, we stopped. We didn't um, because everybody is, it is investing in COVID. All the research dollars are going to COVID and, it, and very understandably so. Um, but what's happening is everything else is going on the wayside. And I don't want that to be a big, a big problem because um, some fertility clinic um, posted some stat that for every day the fertility clinics were closed, there was 3,566 babies not born every week. And so if you do the math, there's actually less babies born than there are people dying from COVID. <laughs> and I once listened to an economist, an economic uh, professor say that the number one thing that impacts our country the most is our inability to re replace us. So China and Japan, they are, their, their economies were dying because their population was getting old and they had that one child policy. And so now they're like, oh my gosh, who's going to replace our workforce? And so if you're an investor, don't just look at COVID, look at other things. Women need to continue to have babies. When they shut down the fertility clinics, women did not stop trying to conceive. They kept doing it. Their clocks were still ticking. They, they still needed the resources. There are still women that are gonna get pregnant. They're still gonna be born. We need to foster the innovation in this space to keep it going. Cause if we don't, it's a disaster. Like that's the number one thing that can impact um, America. And his tagline was, to make America great, procreate. <laughs> I wanted that like a hat, 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, like, Thank no, no, you no, for that, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll, we'll make one for you. That was excellent, Amy. I, and I think you also see that in the policies a lot of European countries right now and being very proactive in supporting um, fertility policies. I think as we think about investors, we also have to remember that women make 80% of the healthcare decisions for their families. So they're not just making for themselves, they're making for their children, they're making for their parents, in my case, sometimes for my in-laws. You know, so having a relationship and having that woman being empowered with data and information and being very comfortable with telemedicine is going to be something that's going to be applicable to the entire healthcare spectrum to the entire family. Good. Yeah. I would say um, to play the long game, like take the long view, this health, health tech, health tech innovation, changing these systems, it takes time. We've, you know, it takes a long time. So realizing return on investment, um, you know, according to tech, uh, typical uh, tech startup world is just, it's not realistic in, in healthcare tech um, because there are so many moving parts. And as we've seen, it's taken a global pandemic to get uh, clinicians to make some, some, you know, incremental behavior change. Um, so, you know, evaluating companies based only on how fast they can turn, you know, turn a profit or make a return is in, in this, you know, in this segment is just not realistic. Um, but, but these companies should be invested in because it matters and it matters greatly um, to the health and wellness of our entire society. Yeah, good. I have another question here. I'm in my late 30s and my husband and I are ready to start trying to conceive. Because of COVID-19 and the talk of another flare-up later this year, what is your recommendation on trying to conceive in these uncertain times? Is it okay to start trying or should we wait until there's a vaccine? I'm not sure if you all can answer this, but... Um... Okay, we are not your medical doctor. We're not allowed to treat or diagnose <laughs> you. There's the disclaimer. Um, and it's, it's very unique to their situation. If they're an essential worker and they're exposed to COVID on a daily, I would say maybe wait. Um, your late 30s, your time is ticking. I would say definitely reach out to a doctor um, and, and, and tell them your unique situation. Um, you know, our medical advisor, and I've heard her talk several times, says um, as long as you're safe and your risk is low and you want to keep conceiving, I will support you at the best way we can. Um, what we tell our, our provers is that either take this time to learn about your body and then have better empowered conversations later, or if you're safe, we support the fact that you want to try to conceive. Um, and so there's no data out there that shows that because you're pregnant or because you're trying to conceive, you're at higher risk. Um, and so you just have to take your, you know, your, your unique situation and follow your heart is what I like to say. So. Good. My next quick, good answer. Um, my next question slash comment is you're all amazing and I love the entrepreneurship in this session. You've discussed a lot about the relationship between patients and their providers. What role does and should policy play in the future of femtech? A huge role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tremendous, outstanding role. So for instance, um, yeah. let me give one example. Uh, in the world of telehealth and remote patient monitoring, um, remote patient monitoring was not reimbursed um, mm -hmm. by CMS. And so uh, kind of trying to figure out the puzzle of how to um, get healthcare systems and physicians bought into uh, remote patient monitoring and all of the economics around of that when they cannot bill for it or be reimbursed for it is a huge barrier to making what would otherwise be like an obvious choice. My patients are asking for it. I know it'll make my life easier. You've got the best practices and the system in place. It's turnkey, let's rock and roll. But wait a second, who's paying for it? What, who's reimbursing this if it's not reimbursed, right? Anyway, with COVID, yeah. um, like literally overnight, so telehealth, um, so a couple of telehealth codes came through mm -hmm. and clinicians can now utilize them and they can now bill for their, the telehealth services that they're providing to their patient population. It is brilliant. So it's, that's just one example. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. That's a great example. And we've seen that, um, you know, from a policy change specifically here in the state of Colorado, where all sort of restrictions, not all, but a lot of restrictions around um, telehealth went away. So policy does play a really important role, and especially um, getting reimbursements for some of these at-home tests and analyzation of these in-home tests would be really important for, for many of our entrepreneurs. Um, so we're out of technical time on the Boulder Startup Week, but there's no one following us because we're not in an actual physical room. So I'm going to go ahead and take these next two questions, the, the silver linings of a remote conference, um, and ask this next one. So do any of your products, and I don't know the answer to this, but do any of your products or services have a mental health reporting data component? If yes, examples of how it's used or the outcomes. Our product, um, one of the one of the big key features in postpartum health is mental health. Um, so I would say mental health is a big component of our product. We don't currently have reporting or data tracking, um, but it's something that we're working on and um, and considering maybe piloting um, in the near future. So definitely, it's it's something interesting. Uh, it's just a little bit of how is that data going to be used? We, right now, is it just for like on um, Kandara, for example, is it for your own tracking purposes and you know to be able to talk to people or we don't really want to do self-diagnosis. So it'd be more of a discussion tool mm -hmm. for your provider, um, but potentially you could be tracking your mood and, and it can help you pay attention to when you might be at higher risk. So on the Kandara platform, women can track all kinds of um, symptoms that they are entering into the platform, including mood. There's, um, there's, four, there's drop downs that they can self enter whatever information that they want to be tracking and we'll be increasing those over time. And so they can do their own correlation or they can share that with their physician. So it's not an objective biometric associated with um, a mental health parameter, but it is their own tracking. Good. Good. My last question is, and this is a question we get from a lot of our clients as well. Does the health tech industry have a role to play in getting providers to believe the data that's generated at home? I'll start it off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the things that we do to, you know, have have doctors believe in our technology is what we do to have patients believe in the technology and that's data we do clinical studies we got our fda clearance um you know we have we have reviews on amazon where people talk about what happened you know with the product so it's just about showing that it is a safe and accurate um uh test and you know physicians want to see the data too <laughs> just like women want to mm -hmm. see the data um, and so, yeah, it's absolutely our, our responsibility to show that our product will fit their needs as well. Absolutely. Great. Thank you all so much. I am so grateful to Amy Shannon, Judith Nolan, Sarah Bates, and Amy Beckley. Please, um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, or any of us, um, we'd love to be a part of your ongoing con uh, conversation as you learn more about femtech, as you think about developing solutions that meet women's needs during this time, and then uh, really affecting the future of healthcare and beyond. So thank you all so much for joining us. There are over 60 events happening online for Boulder Startup Week over this week. Check out the schedule at boulderstartupweek.org. We're also hosting another um, talk on Thursday with Nico from Redox and a lot of other leaders from the Boulder area on health innovation in a pandemic. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.